This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. I ventured up into my attic recently to pull out an old shoebox of cassette tapes. It's the box, I think. Oh, yeah. A bit dusty. They're from 1994. I was studying red squirrels in England for my master's degree in ecology, and I recorded the whole experience on my Walkman. Red squirrels, 1994. Here's a bit of the tape. I'm walking through this forest and uh, I've got 30 or so traps laid out. So we've set our traps, caught the squirrel, fitted a radio collar to the squirrel that you want to follow and now it's a case of actually following the bleeps that that the, the collar emits. So let's give it a go. Now you can perhaps hear a faint bleeping. Talk about a trip down memory lane. The UK has just one native squirrel species. They'd almost disappeared all over England, and I was studying their home range and activity patterns, just like I'd do later with slightly larger grizzly bears. This is the second trap that I've set. So I'll just bring the trap down from the tree. This is one that I've been tracking. This is a a female, and uh, she's not lactating. Otherwise, her nipples would be showing through from her white chest hair. She's still got the tuft on her ears. Sometimes they lose those during the summer molt. The red squirrel was a species right on the brink of extinction. So rare and endangered, it became a British darling. Not a bear or a big cat, but a little red rodent. In fact, all over the British Isles, They adorn magazine covers. Entire organisations revolve around them and their conservation needs. Everyone wants to see this fluffy-eared, endangered species bounce back. It's a bit different where I live now. Sometimes it feels like there are squirrels everywhere. Here in the USA, there are 11 native species. Some of them live underground, some in the trees, some even fly. There are pine squirrels, Douglas squirrels, ground squirrels, grey squirrels. They're pretty cute, but it might be hard to think of them as special. But today, nearly 30 years after my research in England, the story of the elusive red squirrel in the British Isles is still unfolding. And the tale of this creature has become very curious in one place in particular. Turn left to stay on Dublin Road. Ireland. What's happening in Ireland is very special and this is watched across Europe by those trying to save and conserve red squirrels in their woodlands. But the red squirrel has an adversary, one that's twice its size. They're more adaptable, more brazen, and they've been bounding across Ireland, squashing any hope of the red's return, the North American grey squirrel. The grey squirrel is twice as big as the red squirrel. It can survive in more habitats. It also um, is, is bigger and stronger. But now, in an odd twist that really deserves its own place in the Irish storybooks, a third player has entered the scene. And even though this player is a predator that eats squirrels, it is turning things around for the resident reds. Driving through the Irish countryside, I love it. I've travelled to Ireland to unravel this riddle, to tell the tale of one squirrel against another, and how a wily carnivore called the Pine Martin is coming back, restoring balance and actually helping its prey return to the Emerald Isle. Stay on the left, Chris. From KUOW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild.
This is pretty crazy. I'm in St. Brandon's Cathedral in the town of Loch Ray in County Galway in Ireland. I arrived in Dublin yesterday from the USA, rented myself a car, and began my drive across Ireland in search of some answers. And this is where my great, great, great grandfather was married. My family goes back a long way here in County Galway, and with a bit of guidance from my auntie Vron, who's obsessed with family trees, I've stopped by here to think about the past. It's a pretty incredible thought to think about my ancestors spending time in this very building in the 1800s. Wow. A lot of Irish people left home in the mid-1800s. Some of my family headed to England. Millions came to the USA in search of greener pastures. But a different kind of migration began a little later, and in the opposite direction. To understand the whole story, we have to travel back in time. It's 1911. We're at a wedding in Longford, Ireland, standing outside this huge grey castle called Castle Forbes. One of the wedding guests arrives from England, and in a cage, he has a little surprise. Well, 12 little surprises, actually. His wedding gift takes the shape of a dozen bushy-tailed animals, North American grey squirrels. It's quite the spectacle. No grey squirrel has ever set foot in the country of Ireland, but here they are. As the celebrations unfold, the 12 squirrels are released into the forest next to the castle. Okay, now fast forward 100 years. Oh, it's a blustery fall day here this morning. About uh, seven o'clock in the morning and about to head out to start looking for little Irish creatures. I've just arrived at Balik Castle in County Mayo on the western side of Ireland. It's a huge stone building from the early 1800s surrounded by a sweeping green lawn and a forest of huge beautiful trees. All these trees are covered in ivy, and it feels like it's, uh, it's become nighttime again. It's so dark in here. Wow, how mysterious and wonderful. I'm here to meet someone who knows a lot about the tale of the red squirrel. Ruth just texted, I've parked at the castle. Ruth Hanafy. She's a mammal conservation biologist with the Vincent Wildlife Trust, and she wanted us to meet here because this is where we might have a chance of spotting a rare red squirrel. Rare because those 12 grey squirrels from the wedding multiplied into a quarter of a million of them in Ireland and began wreaking havoc on the resident red squirrels. But this is a place where greys have not taken over yet. I was going to have a quick look at my map. Yeah. Um, so, oh, we should probably start whispering in case yes. we're in squirrel vicinity. Head to the river, take a left, and then stay in the main path until we go over a small bridge and then right down towards the river again. It's become very hard to find a native red squirrel. Ever since the American grey squirrels were introduced in the early 1900s, they've spread to cover most of the eastern half of the island of Ireland. Even the River Shannon couldn't stop them. Unlike the Reds, the larger greys are not picky when it comes to food, and they have large fat reserves that help them survive, even in the toughest of winters. And they can live just about anywhere. They don't need large amounts of forest or wooded areas. They do just fine in a park or even a garden. They spread more easily. But they're not the only thing that's spreading. In Ireland, um, one of the main issues is the, the grey squirrel carries a squirrel pox virus. It is just a host. It doesn't affect the, the grey squirrel at all, but it is fatal to the red squirrel. The reds are being squeezed. The greys are not just tougher and more adaptable. They're also carriers of this silent killer, the squirrel pox. The greys aren't affected by it, but it's usually lethal to the reds. The power imbalance is so extreme that it's estimated that when grey squirrels populate an area where red squirrels live, it only takes about 15 years for the entire red squirrel population in that area to just disappear. Ruth finds something on the forest trail. 
It looks like a red squirrel's been near. So we have a tree cone and all the scales have been stripped very neatly. It's absolutely bare. So there was a, a squirrel enjoying a nice meal up this tree above us. Yeah. Um, dropped the cone down and this is just, it's wonderful. It's the first sign we've seen. Should we follow it? Yes, definitely. I used to find gnawed cones like this studying red squirrels in England. It was always exciting because it was just a little clue that these endangered squirrels were around. In ecological science, the word competition comes up a lot. It's an important concept because it determines which species succeed to survive and mate, and which ones don't. Survival of the fittest. And with red and grey squirrels, it's not just actively being better at finding food and mates. Sometimes it's more passive. It's about just not dying. In Ireland, the greys and reds are showing two types of competition. Resource competition, the resources of food and habitat. The greys are better at exploiting these things because they're more dominant. The second type is disease-mediated competition. Squirrelpox is killing off reds, but not greys. In this way, the greys passively outcompete the reds. The greys win this competition too. These two types of competition are powerful, and they've been well documented. And it means the odds are stacked squarely in favour of the non-native grey squirrels. So for the reds to survive, the greys have to go. But short of an extermination programme aimed at controlling the grey squirrel, there wasn't much could be done. Red squirrels have continued to disappear from forests invaded by grey squirrels. Until now... Red squirrels were being seen where they hadn't been before. How did scientists find out that the red squirrels were coming back? Well, it came from anecdotal evidence of people seeing red squirrels Mm. in their local woodland and saying, I haven't seen this red red squirrel here in 20 years. About 15 years ago, scientists started receiving reports of local citizens spotting red squirrels in their local woodlands where they hadn't seen them before. They were thoroughly surprised. The science had already established that the resource competition and the disease-mediated competition were favouring the grey squirrels. So how could it be that all of a sudden the red squirrels were winning? It all comes down to a third creature in the Irish woodland, one that had been on the edge of extinction, and one of Ruth's favourites. They have this beautiful, illustrious fur, and they are gorgeous. The, the bib pattern is fantastic because it's unique to each individual, because the bib pattern is like a fingerprint. The Pine Martin. How this third character, a predator of the red squirrel, is actually saving the red squirrel. After the break... I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. I remember seeing a Pine Martin image and thinking it was the most beautiful creature to look at, this exquisite face. This beautiful In Ireland, they call them cat crans, Gaelic for tree cats, because they're so adept in the branches. The Pine Martin is in the weasel family, just like its cousin, the American Martin. They look a bit like a miniature wolverine, and pound for pound, just as tough. And then they've got this beautiful cream lining the ears, the short muzzle, um, really beady eyes, and the, this fabulous bushy tail. And this bushy tail actually helps them to balance when they're up in the canopy on branches. So it's, um, it's part of their overall um, fantastic arboreal dexterity. But don't let looks deceive you. The three-pound European pine martin is a voracious eater of squirrels. Both kinds. Ruth's been doing research on them for the past eight years, but she can count the number of times she's seen them on two hands. They are elusive creatures, terrified of humans. But they are in this forest, alongside the red squirrels, somewhere. 
Ruth has some tricks up her sleeve when it comes to finding them. So if I was um, looking for Martins, which I, I guess I am, I'd be looking around here for any signs of scats in around the root plate. The root plate is made up of the woody roots close to the trunk, a nice conspicuous spot to poop. Pine Martins do this, we call it a kind of a bum shuffle at the end of when they're leaving a scat, which leaves a little spiral at the end. So uh, 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 it's it's like a little a little wriggle. What did you call it? Uh, it's kind of like, I'd say a bum shuffle, but it's more like a wriggle. That's probably very untechnical. Very, te- very scientific. Yeah. <laughs> I can show you on a trail cam footage, and they do when they're when they're marking. So the, the scat tends to have a little um, spiraled end, which is distinctive from the scats of some other species. Pine Martin scat is often packed with squirrel fur, and it doesn't just look unique, it smells unique too. People say it smells like parma violets. Pine martin prey on all kinds of creatures and plants. Berries, fruits, amphibians, birds and small mammals. And their numbers had been dropping for years. They'd become incredibly rare too, just like the red squirrels. But with protection, this little carnivore was coming back. And something curious was happening as they returned. As pine martens recovered to a woodland, to a specific density, the research has found that grey squirrel numbers decline and grey squirrels vanish. Now, within a lag period, approximately two years, red squirrels can then return to this woodland. It turns out that the pine martin was playing a major role in the competition between the greys and the reds. It was actually reversing the advantage that the greys had in favour of the reds. A pine martin will take a red squirrel. It will predate on a red squirrel. But red squirrels are adept at living alongside pine martins. They are smaller, they're lighter, they can easily move out to the edge of branches of trees. They're very nimble arboreal creatures. And they are aware of a pine martin being a predator and being mm. in the vicinity. They're alert to them. They're, 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 alert. They've coexisted with them for so long. Yeah. Exactly. And what the research has found is that grey squirrels exhibit a predator naive response, which basically means that when there's a pine martin in the vicinity, they will keep feeding. They won't show the same alert signs of danger as a red squirrel appears to. A predator naive response. When the grey squirrel sees a pine martin, they don't know to be afraid. Unlike the red squirrels that have been playing an evolutionary cat and mouse chase with the pine martin for thousands of years. Scientists have taken this theory even further by doing scent tests with red and grey squirrels to test how afraid they are of pine martins at a squirrel feeder. Prey species like the squirrels often use their sense of smell to avoid predators. So the scientists placed pine martin scent at the feeders and saw something really interesting. Only the red squirrels avoided the feeder and became more vigilant, standing up on their hind legs, heads up, tails twitching, waiting for a safe moment to feed. The greys, on the other hand, didn't show any change in behaviour in response to the scent of a pine martin. We have footage of a pine martin at a feeder and then a red squirrel comes to the edge of the branch and kind of dances around looking at it, but it, it doesn't kind of um, leap away afraid, but it's clear that there's an interaction there. Um, but but they're, they're just familiar with being able to, to outwit and live alongside pine martens. And this predator-naive response can actually shift the balance in an ecosystem. Every five years, Ruth and others surveyed woodlands across Ireland with the help of citizen scientists, and they could tell that the density of pine martins in a particular woodland was enough to cause the grey squirrel numbers to drop. Then, over the next two years, the red squirrels would slowly take their place. Pine martins were affecting the race between reds and greys by inserting a third type of competition between them. The dominance of the greys was being undercut by the pine martin's ability to kill them. It's called predator-mediated competition, and it's a rare case because it overrides and even reverses the advantage the grey squirrels have over the reds when it comes to finding food and avoiding disease. This is a huge discovery for Ruth and other mammal conservation biologists, and scientific proof that pine martin are helping the return of the red squirrels. After all, like the old saying goes, 
The enemy of my enemy is my friend. We've seen something extraordinary happen, which is without human intervention, the red squirrel has been able to naturally recover. And it really emphasises how this is a, a, a balanced ecosystem. And really the things that throw it out of balance are us. Us. Surprise, surprise. The human impact on this ecosystem. The relationship between humans and pine martens in Ireland goes back centuries and beyond. This little carnivore has had a long and complicated existence here. It's been around for over 6,000 years. But just like the red squirrel, hundreds of years ago, the population of pine martens began to decline until they too came close to extinction just a few decades ago. They used to enjoy beautiful, lush forests filled with almost endless trees and hiding places. But over the... over the... The hundreds and thousands of years, um, we lost this forest habitat so that Ireland had the lowest forest cover in Europe. Only about one and a half percent is deciduous forestry, um, which is, is the, the most suitable habitat type for pine martens. Ireland is about the size of Indiana. That's a lot of lost pine martin and red squirrel habitat. And it wasn't just deforestation that made pine martin numbers drop dramatically. They were also hunted for their pelts as far back as the 1100s. There are famous Renaissance paintings that show characters wearing Irish pine martin coats. The beautiful dark brown and cream colored fur became a major export in Ireland. Ships that came from Ireland to England even had to pay higher excise taxes if they didn't have pine martin furs on board. They were like animal currency. Pine martens have been here for thousands of years when this was a very different land. And the reason they were almost wiped to extinction and the reason that they are persecuted is because of us. Persecuted, like carnivores everywhere, by poisoning and trapping. So by the time the 1900s come around, the pine martin was almost extinct. By the way, that was right around the time those 12 grey squirrels were given as a wedding gift released into the forest, and no pine martens to keep them in check. But finally, in the 1970s, the pine martin was protected by law in Ireland. They could no longer be captured or killed. It gave the pine martin some breathing room and an opportunity to begin a comeback. Nature back in balance. The reds are happy, the pine martens are happy, The only ones losing out are the greys, and they're not supposed to be here anyway. But wait, not everyone is happy about the pine martin. They are practically everywhere in Ireland. You know, they've really expanded over the whole country. I don't think there's any place in Ireland at the minute where there's no pine martin. This is Dan Curley, president of a hunting and conservation club. He believes the now growing pine martin population needs to be controlled. They have complete status in that they cannot be touched by anyone. If I had a pine martin there killing my pheasants tomorrow morning, I can't take out the gun and shoot him. Mm. I have. If you were watching him doing it, you couldn't. Yeah, I can't even take out the gun and shoot him. No. Because I'd be breaking the law if I did. It's true. Pine martins have broken into pens and killed hens or birds. They're opportunistic carnivores. Dan's not against pine martin. He just wants some practical kind of protection for the birds and other hunted species. As pine martin numbers grow, part of Ruth's job is to smooth the way between them and humans. She wants to see them return, so she does trainings around Ireland, educating people about this little-known species. And practical things like how to deter pine martins if you have birds that might tempt a predator. What we do in that case is to to outline exactly how to pine martin-proof your pen. Keep birds in your garden, but make sure that the pen is is um, protected against an animal that's clever and inquisitive and and will be able to find any gaps like rotting wood to chew or any holes to enlarge so just make sure that it's pine martin proofed and then the martin will obviously um, find more suitable prey in the wild. Dealing with this kind of human pine martin conflict is a big part of Ruth's job. I think the hardest part when your entire world is wildlife is to just find a place to understand why someone would persecute or or really hate them. And some people do really hate them. 
There's a stigma against these little creatures, and you can see it in the headlines. Some of them get pretty wild. Pine martins causing the death of multiple cows or boring a hole in a lamb's neck. There is one newspaper headline saying that a pine martin could take a small child, and clearly that is out without any basis in reality. And you know, this is a small cat sized animal, but this makes its way onto a headline and will just reinforce and perpetuate the fear people have. One woman I ran into on the trail in the woods definitely did not want them in her garden. Uh, no, I don't think so. Why, Why not? They're meant to be quite vicious, so I don't know. It might be a bit scary. It stirred quite the conversation. Do they not attack humans? I always thought they were like... (laughs) But it seems that the pine martin are here to stay. Their numbers have stayed pretty stable over the past decade, helping the red squirrels return as they regain a foothold across Ireland. Ruth tells me about a lady with a story I should hear before I leave. It's a bit of a drive away because she lives right on the western edge of Pine Martin Range the Pine Martin frontier, where they're paving the way for Reds and keeping the Greys in check. Ruth and I caravan south a couple of hours to where the lady lives. Her name is Angela and she lives way out there. It took me down every single back road from here to Mayo. That was the weirdest route ever. (laughs) Me too. I couldn't believe it. The very narrow country lane ends at a lakeshore. It's windy. Small white-capped waves are rolling in. I pull up to a thatched cottage. Okay, this is the spot. It's nice to meet you. You too, Chris. Delighted Thanks. to Thanks see Thanks for you. having me here. Not this at is. All, uh, not at all. I'm curious about your story. Okay. <laughs> well, if you want, we'll go around the back, and I'll be able to explain a little bit better the situation. You Perfect. Know? Yes, I'll follow you around. For Angela's privacy, she's asked that we don't use her full name. Not everyone would be excited about the story she's about to tell me. A couple of years ago, she heard a curious noise in her house. We went into lockdown last mid-March, or sorry, March of 2020. And then I was now working from home. And I was at my desk. I heard this awful commotion, um, got a bit of a fright, ran over, banged on the door. I opened the attic door and right in front of me was a scat. Okay, And uh, I photographed it, sent it to a friend of mine and he said... Possibly Pine Martin. Pine Martin scat. There was a pretty good chance a Pine Martin had reached her home and moved in, way out here. Probably what I did do then, which was a mistake, I completely forgot about it. So that was around (laughs) early April. How did you forget about a Pine Martin in your attic? Well, unfortunately, (laughs) sorry, I did. She didn't see the actual Pine Martin, but then two months later something even more extraordinary happened. I'd say it was around mid-May I heard what sounded like kittens. So she grabbed her phone and started recording. Gets a bit louder. Wow. Baby Pine Martins. She had a whole family in her attic. The perfect place to raise your young. Dry, warm and welcoming. Airbnb for Pine Martins. No doubt about it, you know. The Airbnb of all Airbnbs. You seem like such a a, a lovely landlady as well. I'm not surprised. What could you do? You know, what could you do? And she understands the ecology at play. I like the idea of the Pine Martin recolonising areas, you know, Mm -hmm. because... The grey squirrel, I think, is becoming a bit of a problem. These little predators in her attic represent the next generation of pine martin, helping the next generation of red squirrels. One rare species unwittingly helping another as both of them come home. Do you like the idea of pine martin being back in Ireland? I would absolutely love if they were back. The pine martin family eventually left Angela's attic once the young had grown. Last year, the Irish National Parks and Wildlife Service put up a den box for Angela in her garden, hoping the pine martin might move in. I would have given anything if they had established themselves in my den box. Yeah. You know, I think that would have been fantastic. The pine martin haven't moved into her box yet, but she's hopeful. 
and so is Ruth. It seems like this is a creature that people can be very proud of in Ireland as this story unfolds. Definitely. And for some it's about accepting the animal's return, but I think it's about acknowledging that the Pine Martin's return has allowed the red squirrel, which was on a path towards extinction, to return again to our woodlands. And this is something that is watched with curiosity and wonder across these animals' range because it's only happening in Ireland. And it's a really significant conservation success story that we are getting to showcase and learn about. As I leave Angela's place, I ponder on it all. I never did see a pine martin or a red squirrel. Come to think of it, I never even saw a grey squirrel for that matter. Maybe it helps keep the mystery alive. All across Ireland, den boxes are going up for red squirrels and pine martins, and education programmes by Ruth and others are paving the way for these two very intertwined species. And although the grey squirrels may never be completely gone, there's a new sense of balance unfolding here. Nature is incredible and and this is something that no one could have predicted. And it's really wonderful when we can restore this balance as much as possible. As is so often the case with ecology, so many stories seem to begin with one species and end with another. Throw a carnivorous predator into the mix and interesting things can start to happen. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about wolves, lions, or these three-pound pine martin. These creatures can help to recalibrate an ecosystem. And in this case, even reverse the outcome of intense competition between two species. But it does make you wonder, just how long will it be before the gray squirrels evolve and learn how to outwit the pine martin? just like their red cousins do. Perhaps that's the next chapter in the ongoing tale of the Irish squirrel. A special thanks to Colin Stafford-Johnson for the inspiration to tell this story. The Wild is inspired not just by nature, but by the people who work in it, love it, protect it. Check out our Instagram at The Wild Pod, and you can find me at Chris Morgan Wildlife. The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. Our producers are Lucy Suchek and Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Paul Lister, Mark Wilkins and Rebecca Badger, Bob Yellowlease, Barbara Stolman and Annie Mize. Our production team includes Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Michaela Giannotti Boyle, Kara McDermott, Tio Popescu, Darcy Riggins Smith and Brendan Sweeney. Additional production support from Bill Simpkins. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. Additional music from Paul Wendell. I'm Chris Morgan. If you enjoy the wild, please spread the word. We tell these stories to reach and inspire as many people as possible. Thanks so much for listening.